Back in the 80s, Spider-Man gained the symbiote suit, which was just a black suit which happened to be an alien. Well, as the years went on, he eventually lost that suit and it became Venom. But what about those untold stories? The things that he did while he had the alien suit that we never heard about? Well, Marvel had the same idea. And over the course of a couple of years, they started coming out with miniseries in which we got to find out what happened to Spider-Man when he had the black suit. Today's video is a collection of those mini stories, four of them to be exact, in which we find out what happened to Spider-Man with the black suit, stuff that we never heard about, written by some of the original writers from the time period in which he did have the black suit. This is the series known as Symbiote Spider-Man. And you have also found yourself at Comic Story, where I read comic books back to you as an audio drama. The purpose of this channel is to allow you to know what's going on in the world of comics so that you know what to collect, pick up, and add to your collection. So let's get into the four Symbiote Spider-Man storylines that we're going to be covering today. Mysterio sits in a warehouse with a cracked helmet telling himself that this wasn't supposed to happen. He was done. He was finished. Why is this happening? The black costume Spider-Man shouts for him to get back up. He's not going to punch a man who was just lying there, so get up so they can finish this battle and go to jail. Mysterio thinks to himself that there's no way. No way he's going back to jail. Spider-Man thinks that he's done. Fat chance! As he starts to get back up, Spider-Man webs his chest, throwing him into a stack of boxes. One of those boxes were the personal items that belonged to Mysterio, and among the scattered belongings was a broken picture of him and his friend Johnny. After barely managing to escape Spider-Man, Mysterio went to Johnny, where they planned for a bank heist. Something that they'd be able to cash in on and get out of this, get away from New York. But Johnny is currently working for Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of New York. So he uh, respectfully declines Mysterio's offer. The next day at the Sun Trust Bank on Madison at 53rd, Audrey Hunting comes into work to find a strange box on her desk. She calls to her husband, asking if he sent her a present, and he tells her no. She nervously opens up the box to see a gas mask, with a note that states put it on. So, before she has a chance to ask what it even is, she sees the green smoke spreading throughout the building, and she sees her co-workers fainting. Audrey quickly straps that mask on, and Mysterio appears before her, telling her that she will do exactly as he says. She tells him to please don't hurt her. She has a husband, and she has a little girl. Mysterio simply tells her if she obeys his commands, she won't be harmed. Now open up the vault and no dilly-dallying. As she begins to open it up, a security officer shouts for Mysterio to freeze, and when he turns around, he simply tells him, Make me. The security officer shoots, but Mysterio drops the illusion and appears behind the officer, hitting him from behind. As the officer falls to the ground, Mysterio hears Audrey stating that she doesn't feel so good. You see the bullet pass through Mysterio's illusion and it hit Audrey right in the chest. He quickly escapes, not even taking money, and he sits in an alleyway where he can hear the officer stating that they couldn't see because of the smoke, but they'll get him. The next morning, Spider-Man is sleeping in when he suddenly hears banging on the door of his apartment. The landlady shouts that she needs rent, and Spider-Man yawns, telling her that he'll have it for her tomorrow. He deposited the check, and it'll clear tomorrow. The landlady storms off, telling Peter Parker that it better clear, and that's when Black Cat slips in through the window, asking why does he even put up with that? He could just have Spider-Man hang her upside down somewhere. That'll take the snark out of her. Spider-Man gets up asking, why isn't she in costume? And Black Cat tells him that wouldn't it be harder for her to explain being in costume coming in, opposed to just being some crazy blonde girl climbing in his window? Besides, the costume was dirty. Spider-Man says that today isn't really the best day, and Black Cat tells him that she doesn't really care about the whole Peter Parker thing. So she figured that she would try to spend a day with him and get his point of view. Spider-Man laughs, telling her, fine, fine, just let him get dressed. And that's when the symbiote costume slithers over the floor and covers Spider-Man, dressing him up in his normal clothes. Black Cat begins to shout, what the hell? That thing is alive? And Peter tells her no. He told her before. He got this black suit from Battle World. This machine repaired his costume with this cloth. Black Cat says, right, so it reads your mind when you want to get dressed. That means it's alive, Parker. Spider-Man tells her, no, it's not alive. It's an alien technology. So later that day at the cemetery, Black Cat looks down at the tombstone and says that it's Benjamin Parker, who was, oh my God, is this? And Spider-Man tells her, yeah, it was Uncle Ben. Today is the anniversary of the day he died at the hands of a burglar that he let slip by. 
the Spider-Man that she loves wouldn't exist without him. Black Cat holds Spider-Man's hand, telling her that she's so sorry, but Spider-Man tells her that he just wanted her to see this, to help her understand the Peter Parker side of things a little better. And just then, Spider-Man notices someone in the distance, Quentin Beck, Mysterio, and he's looking right back. The second that he blinks, though, Mysterio disappears. Spider-Man starts to run, shouting for him to stay there, and Black Cat asks, Really? For God's sake, Peter! And a voice asks, You wouldn't happen to be talking to the nephew of Peter, would you? But moments prior, from Mysterio's perspective, he was looking down at Audrey's grave, stating that it wasn't supposed to happen. No one was supposed to die. He didn't want to hurt anyone in his heist. Johnny was right. Quentin Beck isn't a supervillain. It's all pretend. No different than any of his tricks. And he guesses this is it. He should get out of the game before something really bad happens. No one will miss just a little old Quentin Beck, will they? Mysterio looks up to see Spider-Man and Black Cat not knowing who they are out of costume, but he says that he'll probably get out of here before people see him. He doesn't want to start any trouble. So later that night, Mysterio headed back to the warehouse where he says that he recorded a short video renouncing violence as Mysterio once and for all. Maybe he could start up his own special FX company, show them how to do practical effects right, and then he should. But when he looks up at the mirror, he sees Spider-Man and he suddenly slammed headfirst into it. Spider-Man swings again, asking, Why is it my spider sense going off? You're a danger, right? It must be a trick. Mysterio isn't going to fool me. He knocks Mysterio down, and Spider-Man asks, What gravestone was he at today? Was it the woman that he killed in the bank robbery? You were there, weren't you? Mysterio gets back up, stating, I, I didn't! It wasn't! But Spider-Man grabs him, shouting, Just admit it! Mysterio's mind races to come up with something, and then it hits him. He was there mourning for his sister. Spider-Man lets go, telling him, I... I'm sorry. Mysterio looks up, telling him, No, not yet you're not, but you will be! And he pushes down on a button as the entire room explodes. Spider-Man looks out as the fire spreads, and Mysterio says that he has ten seconds to get out of here before the entire place blows up finally. Nine. Eight. Spider-Man turns, sprinting for the window, and he jumps, but the window is a fake window, and he slams into the wall. He gets up sighing. Ah, I really hate this guy. As the seconds count down, Spider-Man bursts through the wall just as the entire building begins to collapse. Spider-Man is thrown into a pile of trash, and as he gets up, his costume begins to revert to his street clothes. Off in the shadows, Mysterio watches, asking, What the hell is that? I have to find out exactly what the hell that is. Because this is going to turn this into a whole new game. The next day on the set of a movie, stuntman Alan Jennings punches an actor, knocking him down. The director shouts, cut, and the others run over to help the actor up. The actor asks if he's okay, and one of the stagehands says that it looks like his nose is broken. So Alan says that it's not his fault that the guy couldn't take a hit. The director then screams that he just shut down the movie, and it's going to take weeks for Alan Jennings' face to recover. It doesn't matter if he's the best stuntman in the business, he's out! Alan yells they can't fire him, and the director says, I'm pretty sure I can! Security! Alan knocks the security guards back, shouting, You want me gone? Fine! I'll get my stuff from the trailer. As Alan gets back to his trailer, he slams the door shut and a voice begins to ask him what's wrong. Are you having a bad day? Well, that's about to change. Alan asks who the hell is there and the smoke fades with Mysterio appearing. I am Mysterio! Alan stares for a moment. Like, Ray Mysterio? Mysterio asks, wait, are you talking about the wrestler? No, I'm the arch enemy of Spider-Man! Witness a small sample of my power. As mysterious projection beasts run around, Alan packs his bag, telling him, Yeah, yeah, nice holograms. You can't fool anyone in showbiz with that stuff. Mysterio holds out a stack of money, asking, What about this? This one is quite legitimate. Go on and touch it. Alan takes the stack, and as it fades, he tells him, Real cute. What's the deal? Mysterio then says that he knows all about him, that he's not a normal man, that his skin is nigh impenetrable, and he has speed and strength. He is a mutant. Alan tells him, look, I'm not some freak. But Mysterio stops him, telling him, yes, but Spider-Man is. A mutant is a creature of nature. And this creature, this Spider-Man, is definitely a freak. It must be hard getting lumped in with people like that, huh? Spider-Man is just a bully out of costume. Wouldn't it be nice to have a little payback? Later that night, Spider-Man heads out on patrol, looking for Mysterio when out of nowhere, green smoke appears. He swings over, shouting to Mysterio, hey, we gotta talk. And Mysterio tells him that there's nothing that he wishes to discuss with him. Spider-Man jumps down, but Mysterio fades away. And he just says, great, 
The spider sense isn't going off and there's no footprints in the gravel. Mysterio begins to reappear somewhere else and says that Spider-Man must be getting slow. Normally, he wouldn't have to wait. Spider-Man webs over, leaping into Mysterio, but as he fades away, he realizes that it's just another illusion. Mysterio appears for a third time and Spider-Man says, This is great. My spider sense is going off, so this has to be you. Spider-Man flings himself up, getting ready to get hit, but a giant fist punches through the illusion, knocking him back. Spider-Man is surprised. What the hell was that? And Alan walks through the smoke, telling him, My name's Hard Rock, and I'm here to kill you. Paid gig, nothing personal. As Hard Rock hits again, Spider-Man dodges, telling him, Hey, I'm going to take that a little personally. Spider-Man then begins to swing, hitting Hard Rock in the face, but he seems to be hitting what feels like a ton of bricks. He shouts out in pain because it's like punching Colossus. Hard Rock begins to lay into Spider-Man asking, what's the matter? Having problems, wall crawler? Aren't you supposed to be the best? As Spider-Man is knocked back again, he says, ah, that's actually Wolverine. He's the best at what he does. And Spider-Man slowly gets back up telling him, all right, I fought Doc Ock, Craven, Electro. This nobody could not be the one to take me down. Just need to delay him for a few seconds. As Spider-Man tries to web up Hard Rock, the webbing bounces off and Hard Rock says, Sorry, the clothing is specially treated. Webbing won't stick. Hard Rock walks over, kicking Spider-Man in the head, telling him, It seems the amazing Spider-Man isn't so amazing. He then pulls out a gun and holds it to Spider-Man's head, telling him, And a bullet to the brain is all that's needed. Say goodbye. But before he can pull the trigger, the costume lashes out, crawling up onto Hard Rock. Hard Rock calls out to Mysterio, asking, what the hell is this stuff? And the ooze then jumps into Hard Rock's mouth and down his throat. Hard Rock begins to gasp for air, but as the ooze drips out of his eyes, there's a loud splat elsewhere. Mysterio is watching from a monitor room, telling him, Oh God, I just threw up in my helmet. The door is then knocked off its hinges and Kingpin steps in asking, Who was just in here? One of Kingpin's assistants says that someone had to be in here. The door was locked. He then looks up at the monitor, stating that he could see it. But who was here, and what were they watching? Out on the rooftop, Mysterio says that he needs to find a better place to hide. Kingpin has cameras all over the place, but God, what did I just see? A few seconds later, a voice calls out asking, Is that you, Quentin? Mysterio turns back, asking Johnny? And Johnny tells him that he shouldn't be here. Kingpin will kill him, literally. Mysterio then says, Actually, there's something Kingpin would be interested in. Something that he treasures above all else power and it's power that the both of us can get so johnny smiles tell me more a few moments later in johnny's office mysterio tells him that the new costume that spider-man is wearing well it killed someone doubtful the webhead even understands its full potential johnny asks if he's sure that it wasn't a self-defense mechanism and mysterio tells him no it was intelligent it conceived and executed a plan and killed its opponent in seconds while Spider-Man was knocked down. If there was only one way to get a sample of it, maybe blackmail Spider-Man or something. Johnny says that they don't have anything on him, but they do have something on his girlfriend that could be useful. The cat? You like cats, right, Quentin? Elsewhere, Spider-Man takes a break from patrolling, talking to himself quietly when Black Cat jumps down, asking what's with the narrating. Spider-Man tells her that he likes to call it thinking out loud. And Black Cat takes a seat, telling him that he should tell his aunt who he is. Spider-Man stops. Where did that even come from? And Black Cat says, well, after he left her at the cemetery, she had a nice chat with her. Spider-Man begins to stumble on his words. What? What did you even talk to her about? And Black Cat snaps at him, telling him, you, obviously. She wishes that she had someone that she could tell anything to. Spider-Man tries to state that it's not that simple, but Black Cat stomps him, yelling that that maybe he's just too used to being the smartest one in the room. He webs off telling her that he's going to shut this down before he says something that he might regret. I'll see you later, cat. Maybe. She heads back to her apartment asking, how the hell is she in love with someone like that? She really only cares about him when he's Spider-Man, not when he's... But before she could finish, green smoke fills the room and Mysterio appears telling her, you can keep musing out loud. Don't let me interrupt you. She jumps out, and as the illusion fades, she lands face first on the ground. Mysterio appears and begins to strangle her from behind, telling her that she could break free if she wanted. Don't disappoint. She snaps the line with her claws and shouts, asking, Why are you even here? You're becoming the villain who captures the loved ones of heroes now? Want to use me against Spider-Man? Suddenly, Mysterio bursts out laughing. No, no. 
I don't want to capture you. I have a job for you. One that I'm going to pay very well for. Take this laser scalpel and container and cut off a tiny bit of Spider-Man's costume. Black Cat asks, do you want me to betray my boyfriend? No way, no freaking way. Not for all the money in the world. Mysterio points to a folder on the table asking, well, what about that then? She looks at it gasping. And Mysterio tells her, you know what that is, right? A detailed file on how the Kingpin gifted you with your bad luck powers. All of it is there in black and white. Your alliance with one of Spider-Man's greatest foes, it's quite thorough. She grabs the folder, but as it fades away, Mysterio tells her, Judging by that reaction, Spider-Man doesn't know, does he? How would he react if the file were to fall in his hands? But then again, if you don't love him, it wouldn't matter, right? Black Cat spins back, kneeing Mysterio in the groin, and as he disappears, he says that it would seem that she has made her decision. She shouts, wait, wait! And as she slumps down in her chair, she holds out her hand, telling him to give her the damn scalpel. Later that night, Spider-Man heads to his apartment and suddenly his spider sense goes on. He asks who's there and she tells him that it's just her. He looks around the corner and sees Black Cat in a robe and as she unties it, he says that this doesn't solve anything. She walks over to the bed asking if he's going to stand there all night. And Black Cat gets up out of bed stating that she's kind of surprised that the knockout chemical in her lipstick worked. But she better hurry and get this over with. She takes out the scalpel and cuts a finger off of the costume placing it into the container. But then she thinks about it. What is Spider-Man going to do when he realizes that he's missing a finger on his glove? She looks back at the suit and realizes that the whole thing is now intact. And she asks herself if it regrew. How did that happen? Figuring that she should just leave, she gets dressed and sneaks back out so she can drop off the piece. While she's gone, the suit slithers up the window looking out. And then it turns back, crawling up onto Spider-Man. And a second later, Spider-Man gets up. Later on top of a building, Mysterio appears asking, Did you get the sample? And Black Cat tells him, Yeah, where's the file? He tells her that he never said anything about giving her the file, just that he wouldn't show it to Spider-Man. Now hand it over or Spider-Man learns the truth. She grits her teeth, throwing the container at him, telling him, I really, really hate you. And Mysterio replies, Yeah, yeah, I have that effect on people. He examines the container, but he feels like someone is watching him. He looks back, shaking off the feeling, stating that he just needs to get this back to Johnny. Whatever this costume's secrets are, they won't be secrets much longer. A short while later in the Johnny lab, the sample is set down and Mysterio asks to be sure that that thing can hold it. Johnny tells him, of course, the jar is unbreakable. You can assure him that. But before he could even finish, the jar shatters and Johnny says, I'm not imagining that, right? That thing is getting bigger. Mysterio tells him that it's fascinating and Johnny adds that it's also creepy. But what the hell is that thing? Mysterio tells him that he's not sure, and that's why they are looking into it. But before the experiments could be done, Kingpin radios in over the intercom stating that he needs an update on the research that's being done. Need to make sure the money isn't wasted. Johnny tells him that he should be there in five minutes, and as Johnny leaves, Mysterio laughs to himself, <laughs> wouldn't want to upset your master. Mysterio then takes a closer look at the sample and says that it can feel his presence, huh? Are you a synthetic organism? And just then, Mysterio feels someone tapping on his shoulder and Spider-Man punches him so hard, his helmet breaks. He opens up the container and when he reaches in for the sample, it jumps away. He gets ready to go after it, but the guards run in telling him not to move. Spider-Man turns back, webbing up the guns and after pulling them out of the guards' hands, he whips them back, knocking them out. Seconds later, Kingpin walks in asking, what are you doing? Do you still have the nerve to? But before he could finish, Spider-Man jumps out the window, escaping. Kingpin then says, the lack of quips, his movement, they all seem different. Perhaps the wall crawler isn't quite feeling like himself tonight? Kingpin then looks over at the knocked out Mysterio asking, and what do we have here? A short while later, a bucket of water is thrown on Mysterio and Kingpin rolls up his sleeves asking, why was Spider-Man here? Mysterio quickly responds, I don't know. And Kingpin punches him, telling him, I don't do well with pleas of ignorance. Why was he here? If you're honest, maybe you'll only leave with a couple of broken limbs. Everyone looks down as the sample crawls onto Mysterio and soon begins to cover up his entire body. Mysterio shouting, do something, what is this? And Kingpin follows up with the same question. What exactly? I'm open to suggestions. As Mysterio's face is covered, he can feel his body reacting on its own and he rips through the ropes holding him down. He stands up with a new, darker costume, stating that he can run. 
but that wouldn't be very sporting. Kingpin grabs him, telling him to sit down, but Mysterio lifts Kingpin up into the air and throws him into the guards. Mysterio then begins to fade away, telling Kingpin, give my regards to your lovely wife and pray I don't return. The next morning, Spider-Man slowly wakes up when he hears a phone ring. He tells himself that maybe it's Black Cat, but when he says hello, Aunt May asks if he's had breakfast yet. She was thinking of going to that pancake cottage and thought maybe they could meet up. As Spider-Man leaves, Black Cat watches, telling him that it's pretty early for him. No reason to follow, right? As Spider-Man jumps on the 7 train, he tells himself that he can't screw this up. Aunt May is reaching out to him. Something is going his way. However, just as he finishes, Mysterio appears behind him and throws a small device sending electricity through the entire train. Spider-Man falls to the ground paralyzed and Mysterio reaches out telling him, I need the rest of this suit. There's no seams or zippers. And Spider-Man reaches up grabbing Mysterio by the arm. He laughs shouting, ha ha ha, that's it. Now we have a ball game. Meanwhile, up on a sign, Black Cat watches. Oh no, this is not good. Mysterio throws his hands up in the air, creating a set of claws, slamming his hand down, ripping through the top of the train. Spider-Man starts to punch into Mysterio, but Mysterio catches it, telling him, is that all you got? Gotta say, a little disappointed. He then takes Spider-Man's arm, punching him with it, telling him, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. Mysterio then wraps his hands around Spider-Man's throat, telling him, you're not the only one with jokes. You won't be able to dodge so easily now. As he begins to raise his hand, a hook is thrown around it and Black Cat pulls back shouting, keep her hands off my boyfriend. Mysterio swipes back, cutting the line, but while he's not looking, Spider-Man kicks him in the chest off the train. He quickly chases after him and he lands in front of the Shea Stadium, with many people that are going to the ball game stopping to ask if it's really Spider-Man. Mysterio jumps through some smoke though, and as Spider-Man swings, the illusion disappears. Suddenly, more Mysterio illusions all appear and they begin to hit, and Mysterio tells him, go ahead and pick one. Black Cat jumps in asking if she can give it a try, and as the illusions begin to focus on her, she patiently waits, and then kicks the real Mysterio, telling him, it's bad luck for you. Mysterio holds his hands together, shooting out a fiery blast, blowing up a car and knocking both Spider-Man and Black Cat away. But before Mysterio can continue, the symbiote sample peels itself off of Mysterio with him asking, what's going on? It doesn't like fire? It's afraid of fire? The sample slithers its way back onto Spider-Man's suit, and just as Mysterio tells him to wait, Spider-Man punches him to the ground. He then reaches down, squeezing Mysterio's throat, but Black Cat puts her hand on his shoulder, telling him not to do it. She knows that he's angry, but this isn't him. Let Mysterio go, and they can go home together. But Spider-Man punches her back, taking his free hand and wrapping it back around Mysterio's neck. He gasps for air, stating that he should have listened, and then releases an electrical shock, throwing Spider-Man off. As he hits the ground, he gets up, asking, where, where am I? Black Cat then asks, what, now you want to be talkative? Spider-Man asks, what are you talking about? How did I even get here? What is going on? Moments later, as the people begin to head into the stadium, a giant T-Rex roars and starts to stomp through the crowd. But as its foot passes through a t-shirt stand, Mysterio scoffs that his hard light aspect is still malfunctioning. Damn that black cat. Spider-Man jumps into the air shouting to Mysterio that he's just about to be as extinct as his dinosaur. And he punches the illusion while Mysterio watches, telling himself that he can sneak off now. However, before even getting a chance to turn around, Black Cat cracks him in the back shouting, one, two, three strikes. Mysterio crawls to the ground and Black Cat stands triumphantly telling him, and you're out. Once he's webbed up, Spider-Man says that he really needs to go. Aunt May is waiting for him. So Black Cat tells him to go on. She'll take it from here. As Spider-Man leaves, Black Cat leans down asking, are you awake? Because I strongly suggest that you keep whatever you learned about me and Spider-Man to yourself. Mysterio is scared, telling her that he will. No question about that. He's just hoping that sooner or later that costume will kill him. Meanwhile, over at the Pancake Cottage, Peter runs in asking if Aunt May is still there and the waitress holds up a note asking, are you Peter? Spider-Man tells her yes and the waitress hands him the note stating that she left. But she also didn't seem surprised that he didn't show up. Spider-Man reads the note, crumpling it in his hand and he hurries home. Once there, he calls Aunt May telling her that he's really sorry. Something just came up in, yeah, two hours. Look, something unexpected, but I have plenty of time. Wait, hello, Aunt May? He hangs up his phone stating, crap. Could my luck get any worse? 
Late one night at Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane, Alistair Smythe is awoken from his sleep as someone tells him that it's time to get up. Alistair looks up to see his father, Spencer, and Alistair asks how he's dead. Spencer says yes, he is, and they aren't exactly him, just taking on a less intimidating form. Alistair tells him, I don't understand, but Spencer asks, do you remember Lewis Tuttle? He was our previous host. Can't exist in this realm without one. Sadly, he got incinerated. Anyway, that's where you come in. Alistair tells him that he needs a new host, and Spencer tells him, bingo! This facility has quite a lab. Seems the insane criminals are the most popular to experiment on. You can gain access to that. We can make you walk again. Just need to whip up a formula and inject yourself. The details will be provided. After that, you'll just need to introduce it to the clinic's ventilation system. Alistair asks, is that all? And Spencer takes his hand. Yes, that is all. Meanwhile, up on the moon, the Watcher sees the event stating that this does not bode well. There are times when he despises his ability to see everything, especially when there is nothing that he can do about it. But this is beyond the parameters of his kind. They do not act. They only observe. But despite being able to see everything, a pillar of light appears on him as he is pulled into a spacecraft. The Watcher doesn't resist, thinking to himself that this will prove interesting. Back down on Earth, a little boy walks with his mother as he sees a balloon blowing in the wind. The boy breaks away from his mother to chase it and ends up running in front of a speeding car. But before the boy is struck, the symbiote Spider-Man webs the boy up and pulls him out of harm's way. As the boy is webbed to a pole, he yells, AGAIN! And Spider-Man tells him, no, not again. Just wait for your mother. A few moments later, as the boy is brought down, the mother yells to him to never run away like that again, who saved him. The boy yells, Daredevil! Spider-Man walks by in his street clothes. Yeah, figures I do something nice and someone else gets the credit. Oh well, at least the world is back to normal. And yeah, Felicia might be annoyed at me, but she'll get over it. A short while later, down at the bugle, Spider-Man walks in and Jonah tells him good timing for once. He'll be going with Ned. So Spider-Man asks, okay, Ned, where are we going? Ned says that they're going to go see Alistair Smythe. Apparently, he wants to talk to Jonah real bad. Spider-Man pauses. Isn't that the Spider Slayer guy? And Ned says the very same. Claims he's developing cybernetic implants that he says can help people who are paralyzed. Spider-Man pauses. Right, a supervillain trying to fix his public image. Because that always ends so well. Back up in space, the Watcher is sitting strapped to a machine and a man asks if they know who he is. The Watcher looks up to see a purple and green suit telling him that he is Kang the Conqueror, occasional enemy of the Avengers, time-traveling despot. If he left anything else out, he does apologize. Kang scoffs, telling him that the Watchers are so faultlessly polite. Do you know why you were captured? The Watcher says that he offers no offensive capabilities, so no, not really. Kang says that he may lack offensive capabilities, but he has an abundance of knowledge. That knowledge will be extracted from him with this machine so that they can survey the information at his leisure. The Watcher asks, what possible reason could Kang the Conqueror have for the Watcher's information? And Kang tells him, because this time-traveling despot is enduring to save the universe. Kang turns on his machine and he indirectly gives the Watcher access to the ship's computers. He's absorbing all the information and somehow he is seeing the future. He sees what Kang saw and this is impossible. It sees him. But before long, the computer begins to overload and Kang's small ship explodes. He now floats around in space as he says, Oh, this is just fabulous. Back on Earth, a doctor comes to Alistair's room as he is injecting something, asking what is he doing. The doctor asks if that has been approved. And Alistair says that it is something of his own creation. And at the moment, he has a tank of it pumping into the ventilation system and it should be throughout Ravenloft Asylum by now. The doctor shouts that he is insane, and Alistair says, In his defense, it is an insane asylum! The doctor falls to his knees as she begins to cough, and Alistair says, And we're off and running! Over with Spider-Man, he's getting ready to enter Ravencroft when his spider sense goes off. Could it be a generalized thing since there are criminals here? Also, is that a solar eclipse? There's no eclipse today. They're not like tornadoes that just happen, so why? Inside, Alistair looks out the window, telling him that this is glorious. It's a display of the Shadow Realm! As matter progresses in the future, it ripples back to the past, history rewriting itself, or did you just think that creation ran only one way? 
When he looks back, he sees the doctor is being taken over by a black mass, and he says, Well, it looks like she isn't fully into shape yet. This is so much more convenient than injections anyway. Breathe it in and you'll become one of my slaves. Like my host, Alistair. As the doctor kneels, Alistair laughs, stating that his lord will not be sorry that they gave him this second chance. Meanwhile, at the entrance of the asylum, Spider-Man goes running in calling for Ned, and he sees more of the Alistair shadows waiting for him, one of which is Ned. Spider-Man gets his suit on and Ned lashes out hitting him. Okay, that was a little fast. There are several of them. Need to get out of here. But as Spider-Man hits the shadow, they all step back, almost surprised that they were hit. Spider-Man jumps over the shadows, trying to get closer to the source of danger, and the closer that he gets, the more his spider sense begins to go nuts. Right now, the source feels like it's coming from up above. Spider-Man jumps into the elevator shaft, starting to climb until he finds the floor that he wants. When he opens it, he sees Alistair. He yells that he should have known that it was him, but this fake Alistair says, No, not Smythe. I am mystery! As Alistair's body darkens, it takes the form of the shadows from before, but a more larger, more menacing figure. Spider-Man asks, Mr. E? Not Mystery Man, not Major Mystery, just Mr. E? Where do I even begin with that one? Mr. E begins to walk closer, shouting, You, brother! As he hugs Spider-Man, he punches him off and out the window. He runs over to follow, but he looks out the window to see Mr. E pulling himself up from the wall, grabbing him, asking, Why in the world would you do that? We're on the same side! We both serve our god! No! Spider-Man pauses. I'm pretty sure that we didn't come up to any sermons, so... As Spider-Man rips out of Mr. E's grip, they both fall to the ground with Spider-Man attacking again, but this time his arm goes through Mr. E. He tells him that he's sorry, but he won't be caught off guard twice. Why are you doing this? Spider-Man tries to pull his arm out, telling him, Well, I was kind of expecting you to be the bad guy and all. And Mr. E headbutts him. We are not the bad guy. We are your kin. We represent the natural order. Our people were there in the beginning. We shall continue to exist to the end. Humanity is nothing but a cosmic blip in the universe. You should know that! Mr. E headbutts Spider-Man again, knocking him to the ground. Cease this game! Stop pretending that you are something that you are not! Spider-Man tries to get up in his daze, telling him, Okay, need to focus on hitting him again, but how? Wait, when I hit Shadow Ned, he looks surprised, like he wasn't expecting it. And with Mr. E, he wasn't thinking. I just did. Maybe if I relax, clear my mind, let the spider sense guide me. Mr. E yells at him. Are you going to surrender yet? It would be very wise to... But Spider-Man punches him, launching Mr. E and splattering him against the wall. As Mr. E pulls himself out, they grow in size, telling him, We did not know that you could do that, but this game ends now! A voice then calls out that they're right about that, and as Mr. E looks up, a sword comes flying down, stabbing him. The Black Knight flies by, yelling, Hey! Was flying by and thought you could use some help. Spider-Man looks up asking what is he doing here, and the Black Knight tells him, you know, saving the day. It's what we do. The Black Knight flies down telling him, okay, first things first, the Eclipse. Is that thing responsible for it? Mr. E yells that creation is moving forward. Uncreation runs backwards. Work it out! And then Mr. E jumps into the shadows to escape, with Spider-Man asking him, now what? Black Knight tells him he isn't so sure himself. Hopefully the answer is out there somewhere. But back up in space, Kang floats aimlessly until a ship stops right in front of him. The hatch opens, allowing him in, and a voice says, Hey! As Kang looks up, he sees Rocket Raccoon pointing a gun. Welcome aboard the Rack and Ruin Thu! I'm the captain and the crew. Name's Rocket. Who the hell are you? Back on Earth, Spider-Man is trying to process everything as he sighs. They really do just let everyone into the Avengers these days, and Black Knight tells him, Thanks for the vote of confidence. Oh, uh, sorry. Didn't realize I was speaking out loud, Black Knight. So let's review. Sun's been eclipsed, we don't know why. We have no idea where Mr. E came from or went to, and we have no idea why he came here. The Black Knight says, the last part I can answer, because Merlin came to me and warned me of this event. Wait, Merlin as in the magician? Did he just appear out of nowhere, Black Knight? And then out of nowhere, Merlin says, yes, that is correct. Spider-Man screams in terror. Oh, oh, so that's what it feels like when your heart skips a beat. Black Knight tells him that things must be dire if Merlin is coming to him outside of his dreams, and Merlin tells him that matters are progressing far too rapidly to wait. He must return to the manse immediately. As for Spider-Man, you must go to the office of, what is the word, the newspaper? The shadow that you call Ned is heading there to dispatch the owner. Apparently being possessed unleashes those sentiments one ordinarily keeps hidden. 
Spider-Man stops. Holy crap! Ned's gonna kill Jameson! I have to stop him. I do have to stop him, right? And Black Knight chimes in. Yes! Yes, you do, Spider-Man! Later at the Bugle, Joni yells at Tyson that they're supposed to be the science editor. How can he not know why there's an eclipse? Screw it, you're fired! Robbie asks if he just fired Neil, and Jonah says, Yeah, they were useless! You can never trust anyone with the middle name Degrassi. But as Jonah gets ready to go through his editorial meeting, there's a sudden crash as Ned jumps through the window telling Jonah, We need to talk. As Jonah begins to run away, Robbie asks, What was that noise? Is something wrong? And Jonah yells back, The answer to both those questions is right behind you, Robbie! Jonah runs into the stairway to escape, stating, I have no idea what happened, but somehow it's Spider Man's fault! Ned slips out of the shadows, telling him, That is always your excuse. Every crappy thing that happens is always Spider-Man's fault, despite him having saved you countless times. Too bad there is nothing to. But then there's another crash as Spider-Man jumps through the window, tackling Ned, sending the two down the stairway. Jonah stares for a moment and yells, I am gonna bill you for that skylight! Meanwhile, back at the Avengers Mansion, Merlin explains to Black Knight, There is a great evil coming, and the only thing that can stop it is the Ebony Blade. Black Knight tells him, okay, does this great evil have a name? It does. It is called Null. Null is a creature of immense power and it poses a threat to all of time and space. At the present, he is contained, but one day that containment will end and he will roam free. It is believed that Null will be vulnerable to the Ebony Blade that may well be the key to defeating him. But first, we must increase the magic within the sword to elevate it to a point of being an absolutely lethal weapon against him. The Black Knight slowly holds out the sword for Merlin to take, but stops. Wait, what is my name, Merlin? What are you talking about? You are the Black Knight. No, what is my real name? Merlin pauses for a moment and smiles. Very good. As Merlin disappears, the Black Knight yells, Show yourself! And Mr. E appears from the sword, telling him, Everything that I said was true. All I lied about was whose side I was on. Mr. E pulls the ebony blade from the Black Knight's grasp, turning it around, stabbing it into his chest. Back at the Daily Bugle, Spider-Man and Ned tumble into the printing room as Ned shouts, How are you able to touch me? Spider-Man says it's because of all the clean, limited, fancy footwork. But Ned kicks off him, telling him, There's more to it than that. You're one of us. Can't you feel it? You are our kin. But we're not going to wait around for you to realize that. As Ned climbs, he jumps onto the printing machine and says, You can easily pass through the machine. However, we must move on. So, uh, bye bye As the shadow controlling Ned separates itself from Ned, leaving him on the printing machine to get crushed, Spider-Man webs up Ned's legs just before they get sucked in. As he sits up, Spider-Man asks if he's okay. And Ned says he's fine, but the Avengers Mansion, that thing took over. It's heading to Avengers Mansion. Spider-Man asks him, are you sure? Ned tells him, yeah, it was inside his head. He was also in its head. It's a two-way street. Over at the mansion, the Black Knight tries to pick himself up, but as he falls back to the ground, he looks up. Oh, perfect. Kang the Conqueror stands over him, telling him not to move. And as the Black Knight tells him to shut up, Rocket Raccoon yells, what part of the don't move thing do you not understand? The Black Knight begins to laugh. Oh, God. I'm hallucinating. I was worried for a second that there was a talking raccoon. And then he collapses. Rocket pokes the Black Knight asking if he's dead. Not very familiar with humans and how they die. Kang says that his sensors indicate no. He's barely hanging on though. And Rocket tells him, we should get him out of here before things get even worse. Outside, Spider-Man webs his way to the mansion when he hears the roaring engines of the Quinjet starting up. As the Wayfarer Quinjet, Tony Stark just announced, takes off. Spider-Man webs onto it. Good. It means that someone is here that can help. Just need to climb aboard and let them know to let me in. Though it's kind of weird that if the Black Knight was ambushed, they'd be leaving. Spider-Man crawls into the cockpit, poking his head yelling to the pilot, Hey, hold up, it's... Aw, crap. In the pilot seat, Mr. E says, Hello, Spider-Man, and goodbye. Mr. E activates the ship's defense barrier, knocking Spider-Man off, but before he has a chance to web onto something, he falls onto the rack and ruin, shouting, Now what? As he falls in, Kang asks, You are Spider-Man, correct? Not quite as identifiable a costume, but the large arachnid on your chest is a dead giveaway. Without a word, Spider-Man kicks Kang into the wall. Hearing the noise, Rocket yells, What is going on back there? Kang fires an energy blast, telling him, How dare you? And Spider-Man jumps over it, firing a web shot into Kang's face, punching him. I'll dare anything! Kang groans, pulling the web off of his mask. Right, enough of that! As Spider-Man lunges again, Kang puts up a barrier, stopping him. For someone who's clever enough to devise his own webbing, you are an idiot, sir. He blasts him away. 
You're encountering someone who can stop the mighty Thor in their tracks. Do you believe you have a chance? For God's sake, we're on the same side. Spider-Man lands. Right, sure we are. That's right, dummy. We are. Rocket tells him. Spider-Man blinks, staring at Rocket. Okay, what the absolute heck? Rocket tells him. Don't matter. I know Kang's deal. What's yours? Spider-Man tells him that his name is Spider-Man, and Rocket tells him, okay. Well, my name is Rocket. Rocket Raccoon? Like the Beatles song? And Rocket asks, what are the Beatles? But Spider-Man jumps to his feet asking whose side are they on? And Rocket says, it's kind of stupid to ask, isn't it? Kang then says that they're all on the same side, and Spider-Man tells him, right, I'm just supposed to believe you guys? Kang tells him, yes, he was trying to save the universe because he lives in it as well. Why else would he be healing him? Kang motions behind him to the tubes in his back. Spider-Man looks over asking, is that the Black Knight? What happened here? Apparently, the Black Knight has been stabbed. And since his sword is missing, we're assuming that that was the weapon used. Presumably by one of these. Kang points to the next tube where a shadow creature is locked up. And Spider-Man asks if that's a shadow minion. He fought one earlier and it kept saying something about how they were one in the same. No idea what they're talking about. Kang scratches his chin. No? No you wouldn't, would you? Spider-Man asks, what is that supposed to mean? You'll find out in due time, sir. The shadow creature bangs on the table, stating that they will kill him, and Kang says, Yes, yes, I'm quite sure that you believe that. However, what is going to happen is that you are about to be extracted from your host upon my signal, and then blasted off into space, directly into the sun that we are passing. Oh, I'd like to see you try. And Kang holds up his hand, pointing his finger like a gun, and shoots. A second later, the shadow creature is sucked away and shot into the nearby sun, with Kang stating, There we go, extracted from the patient. Everyone stares at the tube, with Rocket asking who is the girl, and Spider-Man says that that is Captain Marvel. Rocket asks, isn't that a Kree guy? And Spider-Man tells him, not anymore. You doing okay in there, Cap? Captain Marvel rubs her head as she comes to, and then she sees everyone outside and yells, Kang! And Kang rolls his eyes. Oh, here we go again. Suddenly, Captain Marvel disappears, and Spider-Man asks where she went. Kang states that she's gone infrared. As such, she is intangible. Fortunately, it's nothing that my force field cannot handle. She bounces off the barrier that Kang puts up, and as she falls, Rocket asks, why do humans always greet each other by launching into a fight? Don't any of you guys, like, shake hands? Captain Marvel looks at Rocket. Is that a talking raccoon? And Rocket is getting furious now. What the hell is a raccoon? A short while later, Captain Marvel says that she isn't sure what happened. She was taking a nap, and then a shadowy thing took her over. She could hear its thoughts, all these shadow minds, linked. What one knows, all know. Spider-Man asks if they took Black Knight's sword, and Captain Marvel says yes. They're afraid of it. They think that it can destroy their lord and master. Kang says that if that's the case, they need to get it back and use it themselves. Captain Marvel looks back, scoffing. Right, Kang the Good Samaritan. You want to bring the sword to the side of the angels. Bull, you just want to rule. Kang says that that is true, but please, what would I rule if everyone was dead? As the two bicker, Rocket tells them to shut up. They have bigger problems to worry about. Namely, how is the sword going to be destroyed? Spider-Man says, easy, throw it into the sun. And Black Knight says, that won't do. It can survive a sun. Spider-Man asks, really? Don't you know how hot the sun is? And Black Knight tells him that the sword is no normal blade. Merlin forged it from a star stone. It's as much magic as anything else. Trust me, a star wouldn't do it. Captain Marvel says they don't have to guess where it's going. They're taking it to nowhere. Spider-Man asks, nowhere? Why does it sound like the start of an Abbott and Costello routine? So Rocket spells it out. K-N-O-W. Nowhere. I know the place. Kang yells, of course! I should have thought of it immediately. There's a troll in the market that I heard who can destroy it. She wields both metal and magic. She lived in Norheim, though she relocated to nowhere. Spider-Man asks, why would she go there? And Kang tells him, to get away from her brother. They wanted to kill her. Apparently it was some trollish custom. Who was her brother? And Kang chimes in again. I believe that their name is Ulick. Meanwhile, at nowhere, Ulick did indeed find his sister, Yulcia, though he burst into her workshop just as Mr. E was requesting her services. But before the sword could even be dismantled, Mr. E uses the ebony blade to stab Ulick. While Ulick is down, Mr. E gets ready to deliver the final blow, asking, Where do troll souls go when they die? Valhalla? Oblivion? And guess who we're about to find out? As the sword is swung, there's a loud clang as Yulcia deflects it with her hammer, stating that no one kills her brother except her. Mr. E swipes her back, stating that he just came to have the blade destroyed, but now she had to make it difficult. You stupid! But before he could finish his sentence, Mr. E is blown away by a psychic blast. As the light fades, the head of security, Cosmo the dog, walks in. Idiot. You okay, Yulcia? Yulcia gets up, stating that she's fine, and a shadowy creature wanted to destroy his sword, and then her brother came crashing in. Wait. 
Oh, peanuts. In another part of the market, Yulik yells to give him the sword. But as he jumps through Mr. E, he says, Yeah, I'll get right on that. But with his attention on the troll, Mr. E is kicked in the head by Spider-Man asking, Who's the greater fool? The fool or the fool who follows him? Star Wars quote, you know, since we're in space. Mr. E yells, swinging the ebony blade, but Spider-Man webs it up, telling him, Let the sword go! Mr. E struggles to keep hold, but a laser shoots through him as he asks, Oh, now what? Rocket continues to shoot. Huh? That's weird. Just need to kick it up a notch. A few more beams pass through Mr. E as he says, Yeah, keep firing, you idiot! See if I care. Let's test the energy absorption prowess of the, ah, excellent. Mr. E holds the sword to take on the incoming blast and once charged up a bit, deflects the lasers back, narrowly missing Rocket Raccoon. Spider-Man goes back to attacking, but as his hits begin to pass through, Mr. E smacks him in the back stating, we are adapting, nothing can hurt us now. But then Captain Marvel flies by telling everyone, relax, I got this. As her beams hit Mr. E, he stops asking, what is she doing? She concentrates her hold, stating that she is filling him with ultra-violent light, which is solidifying him. Spidey, Rocket, take him! Spider-Man jumps in, delivering a hard-hitting punch, with Rocket shooting Mr. E's hand, causing him to release his hold. Kang then yells for Spider-Man to get out of the way. I'm going to end this battle. While Kang attacks, Mr. E asks, Do you really think that you can thwart the will of our Dark Lord? Your attempts are nothing. Kang tells him that he does not attempt. I succeed! As Mr. E is ripped from Alistair, Alistair falls to the ground, with Spider-Man running over to check if he's even still alive, asking where did Kang send Mr. E? Kang smiles, stating that they made other arrangements in anticipation of needing somewhere secure to deposit him. Meanwhile, in another part of the galaxy, specifically the Collector's showroom, Mr. E bangs on his containment tube, shouting, Let me out! Let me out now! And the Collector tells him, Oh, oh no! I may not know where you came from, but the Collector doesn't habitually release his prizes just because they ask him to. Over with Yulcia, she begins to clean up her workshop, stating that it's going to take weeks to clean up. Maybe she should pack up, now that Yulik knows where she is. Just then, Yulik punches through the wall, and Yulcia yells, asking, Can't you just use the bloody door? It's right there. Would it kill you to do that? Yulik knocks her down, stating, Why don't I just kill you and we split the difference? As Yulik raises the ebony blade, he is struck in the face with a blast of from Kang, and Rocket charges in, pressing the attack. As Yulik is launched through another wall, Yulcia asks, Really? Doors, what is with you people? Yulik begins getting up, asking, Can't a troll just kill his sister in peace? And Spider-Man tells him, Afraid not, bozo! He swings a few more times, stating, Not as long as the heroes are here to stop him, and Yulik stands up, unfazed, asking, Are you serious? But before Yulik can attack, he is blasted away again as Cosmo floats in. Spider-Man asks, Did you do that? And did you talk, dog? Cosmo tells him, Yes! As Spider-Man throws his arms up, of course the dog talks, because I hitched a ride with a talking raccoon and an Avengers villain, so naturally we're going to meet a talking dog. While everyone turns their attacks to Yulik, Yulcia runs in yelling to stop hurting him. Yulik gets up stating that he isn't hurt, I am just getting a second wind. Yulcia then punches him, telling him that he is an idiot. She fled all the way to the middle of nowhere to avoid him, and he still, still cannot leave her alone. Yulik says that he didn't come for her, he came for the sword. She asks why, and Spider-Man says that he's kind of wondering that himself. And that's when the Watcher towers over everyone, stating, Because Yulik was sent to retrieve the sword. Spider-Man looks up, asking, Do I want to know? And the Watcher tells him to destroy the being who wants the annihilation of the universe. The one called Null. Meanwhile, back at the Collector's showroom, Mr. E begs for another chance. He can make things right. Please just give him back his full power. Null asks, why should I give it back to you? And Mr. E says, Because the sword still remains a threat, I can get rid of it forever, Lord! Believe it or not, I'm in a generous mood. I will restore your power. No longer do you need to inhabit anyone. You are once again whole. Meanwhile, over in the bar on Nowhere, Spider-Man takes another drink. Okay, run up by me one more time, slowly. The Watcher explains that he required the Ebony Blade so that it can be used against a godlike being called the Null. This blade, if wielded by the proper hand, could perhaps slay this god-like being. Spider-Man takes another shot. Gotcha! Heck, bring in Shadow Boy. I'll take him out without even breaking a sweat. At that moment, Mr. E bursts from the ceiling. I am restored! I am myself! I am now and forever Mr. E! Spider-Man pours a third shot. 
I'm starting to wonder if there's something in this crazy concoction. At least we know Kang didn't vaporize him. Mr. E grabs the sword, telling the Watcher, You have a weak grip, one that Mr. E can easily break. Spider-Man groans, rubbing his face. I hate guys who refer to themselves as the third person. They're nothing but trouble. Even Spider-Man hates the ones who do. Mr. E turns back. You do not seem to realize the seriousness of the situation, brother. Spider-Man yells at him. Seriousness? I was flown out here by a talking raccoon and an Avengers villain into a place where the head of security is a talking dog and a troll brother who is ritualistically hunting his sister. All this while fighting a villain who thinks that we are brothers. Forget seriousness and you. Spider-Man swings, punching Mr. E out of the bar and then looks at his fist. Oh, good. I'm able to hit him again. Mr. E gets up. You can rejoice all that you wish. It will be the last time, for I shall destroy the galaxy. Spider-Man jumps out with everyone, telling him, You can consider us the guardians of the galaxy. And Captain Marvel says, I'm pretty sure there's already a group called that, Spider-Man. Rocket begins to shoot again, but his bolts begin to pass through, and Mr. E says, Sorry, as long as I'm concentrating, nothing can hurt me. Spider-Man lunges, passing through. Aw, nuts! And Mr. E tells him, you don't seem to understand. I cannot be defeated! Both Yulcia and Yulik try to attack, but they end up hitting each other with one another's hammers. Spider-Man webs up the sword, stating that maybe they can't hit him, but the sword did something. Maybe they can try that. But while everyone's attacks are doing nothing, Mr. E asks, What possible hope could you have, Hey! The Watcher walks up and Mr. E asks, What are you going to do, observe? How very typical. The Watcher slowly makes his way forward, standing in front of Mr. E, asking, What am I going to do? Hmm. He leans in, almost nose to nose. Watch me. A powerful energy pulse is then released, blasting Mr. E away, causing him to let go of the sword. Rocket jumps up, grabbing it, slamming it into Mr. E's chest, telling him, You should see what this sword could do firsthand! Mr. E sits up, looking at the sword, laughing. Rocket asks, What's so funny? Mr. E smacks him away. I feel no pain! Now that I am fully powered, not even the Ebony Blade can stop me. Not that blade and not any of them. As Mr. E goes on, the Watcher looks over at Captain Marvel and Captain quietly says, I think I get it. Mr. E continues yelling as he raises the sword over Spider-Man and as he brings it down, Captain Marvel claps her hands together, catching the blade. Mr. E asks, How? How are you doing that? And Captain Marvel tells him, You must be confused, so allow me to shed some light. She pulls the sword up, turning it around, stabbing Mr. E in the chest, focusing all of her ultraviolet light and stopping him. As Mr. E begins to break away into pieces, he says that they won't win. You can't! And Captain Marvel tells him, yes, we will. With Mr. E finally destroyed, the Watcher says that their mission has only just begun. They now must go to the future. He must inform his future self that they must fight the battle that he foresaw in Kang's future chronicles. Kang says that he was glad to help, but the Watcher says after they kidnapped him and violently attempted to drain his mind, Kang tells him, Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. As the Watcher puts his hand on Captain Marvel's shoulder, nothing happens. Spider-Man whispers to Rocket that he was expecting some kind of Back to the Future special effect. Rocket tells him, I have no idea what that means. Captain Marvel looks up asking if everything's okay, and the Watcher says that the others of his race are preventing him from time traveling, valuing their credo above even the universe's survival. Fools. Blind fools. Well, so much for that plan. Raccoon, ready your vessel. There is only one thing that we can attend to. We must attend to the Earth's sun, at least. A short while later, just outside of the Earth's orbit, Captain Marvel flies out of the ship, stating that whatever this Null is, she hopes that he can feel this. She rockets herself into the orb, blocking out the sun, and Null begins to scream in pain. He says that something dares hurt him, and when he escapes his prison, whoever and whatever did it will live to regret it but not for a very long time. Later on Earth, Spider-Man says, Look up at the clear sky. Good to see this again. Sorry the whole other plan didn't work, though. Watcher says to let them hope that the universe survives. And Spider-Man says it always does. Well, usually. The Watcher goes on telling him that the Black Knight is currently headed back to the Avengers Mansion. Both Ned and Alistair are both returned thanks to Cosmo. And while it is not a comfort that he can provide him or his allies, he has wiped their memories to give everyone some peace. Spider-Man asks if he can do that, and the Watcher stares at him, with Spider-Man blinking, asking, Why was I up here again? It was a bright and sunny day as the people of New York gathered to try and catch a glimpse of the president as he comes in through the city. The Daily Bugle's J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie try to wait and get a story just as the president gets out of his car to shake Jonah's hand. And at that moment, he suddenly wept. 
Jonas shouts, it's that webbed menace. He's blown it this time, attacking the president in front of millions of people. You're finished, webhead. Spider-Man swings down in his black costume. Yeah, 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 I'm sure that's what the story's going to state. The Secret Service all pull out their guns, yelling to step away from the president, and Spider-Man asks, who, this guy? That's not the president. He grabs a hold of the president's hair, pulling it back to take off the mask, telling them, this is the chameleon, which I'm now guessing isn't having a good day. Jonas stares, telling him, I, I don't understand. And Spider-Man holds up chameleon's webbed hand, telling him, he was actually poisoning everyone that he met, toxic ring on his finger. And the chameleon looks at Spider-Man, how did you know? A friend told me. Now where's the president, Chameleon? Ha 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 ha, you gotta let me go, Spider-Man, or the president dies. How about you tell me where the president is, or you die? Chameleon is stunned by this statement. Uh, excuse me, is that supposed to scare me? Says, when did Spider-Man make threats like that? Spider-Man stops. No, oh, not me. A friend. Look down. Still not believing him, Chameleon looks down and sees a red dot on his chest, and Spider-Man tells him, that's my friend Frank, also goes by the name Punisher. So after a few moments, Chameleon sighs, telling him, the president is at 387 Park Avenue South, seventh floor. So a short while after taking the Chameleon in, Spider-Man meets up with Black Cat, and she asks if it all went okay. Shining that laser did the trick, Spider-Man tells her, like a charm. She then tells him, good, because I got another tip, a heads up robbery. After discussing where she got the tip from, Black Cat explains that it's at the Natural History Museum going for the Viking artifacts at exactly 9 p.m. Spider-Man's stunned. That's exact. Maybe too exact. And she tells him that she's beginning to think the same thing. So as the night fell and the museum closed, the guards all went on patrol when suddenly they come face to face with Moondark. Moondark waves his hand, telling the guards to go play in traffic, and a second later, the guard begins to laugh and run, yelling, Whee! With the coast clear, Moondark then begins to look for what he was sent to retrieve when he notices a small stone by itself on display. He says that that must be the Glowstone. What an imaginative name! But before he could grab it, Spider-Man calls out to him and Moondark spins back, blasting him with an energy blast, and he obliterates Spider-Man. He begins to laugh, ha ha, I did it! I beat Spider-Man, but my victory is short-lived. As Spider-Man begins to jump out of the shadows, punching him. Yeah, really beat the heck out of that web dummy. Spider-Man jumps around, throwing out some quips, and then he webs up Moondark's face. Moondark, in retaliation, throws his magic around, hitting everything but Spider-Man. As the police officers begin to arrive because there's a big commotion happening at the museum, Moondark explains that he doesn't need to tap into Spider-Man's mind, he'll take the weak-minded police officers. The officers all begin to then shoot at Spider-Man as Moondark teleports away. He rips the webbing off of his face, reaching for the Moonstone, but before he could grab it, he feels his feet being pulled out from underneath him with a wire. Black Cat holds a cable telling him that he just needs to stay down, but Moondark casts more magic, stating, This is one of those moments I love being an evil magician! I get to launch counterattacks laced with irony! Now sick him! As a giant conjured tiger lunges at Black Cat, she leaves back telling him, You tell that to a dog, you moron! And Moondark tells her that everyone's a critic. Now with both Spider-Man and Black Cat busy, he breaks the glass case, grabbing the glowstone, reaching for it when he's suddenly struck by lightning. He shakes his head, confused by what had just happened. And he then casts a spell to protect himself, but as he reaches for the stone again, nothing happens. Spider-Man and Black Cat shake off their pursuers, and Moondark holds the stone, stating, Now you will face the utter power of Moondark! Nothing happens again as he tries to use the stone, and he whips his arm out, holding it, shouting, Moondark! Moondark! Still, nothing happens. So Black Cat asks if they can hurry up. She has a movie to get to, and Moondark yells, I don't understand! It's the Nord Power Stone! It increases whatever power you have! But while everyone is staring confused at what is even happening, Moondark is electrocuted again, and the guard from before laughs. Black Cat looks at him, asking, what even happened? And the guard from before who had electrocuted Moondark tells her that he ran into traffic and got hit by a car. Spider-Man picks up the Nord Stone, stating that he isn't one to look a gift horse in the mouse, but wonder why this didn't work. A voice tells him it's because it requires the touch of a godly being to activate it, such as Carnilla, the Norn Queen. 
The stone was surrounded by a charm that prevented her kind from handling it and shielding it from magic users, but Moondark attended to that for her by removing the protection spell. With a flick of her hand, the Norn Power Stone is pulled out of Spider-Man's hand and into Carnilla's. And she stares at it, stating that she can feel its power already. Spider-Man quickly hits her, stating that he needs to be quick if she really is some sort of goddess, but Carnilla lashes out screaming, YOU DARE HIT ME! A portal opens up, sucking Spider-Man in, and Carnilla tells him that she isn't even going to fight him. Farewell, you pathetic! And just as the portal begins to close, Spider-Man webs up the stone, pulling it in with him. The portal closes, throwing Spider-Man and the Norn Stone onto a series of roads as he asks, where is he even at? And that's when he hears a growl, and when he looks back, he says, You've got to be kidding me! The Hulk shouts again as he steps closer, and Spider-Man tells him, Hey, big guy, how's it going? The Hulk charges in swinging, and Spider-Man pulls himself out of the way, yelling, Jeez Louise, calm down! I don't want to be here any more than you do! Wait, didn't Doctor Strange send Hulk off to another dimension where you couldn't hurt anyone? Well, <laughs> so much for that! Spider-Man swings over to another path, asking, What is this place anyway? And a voice chimes in, it does not know it's at the crossroads of reality. And another voice tells him, Indeed, there is much it does not know, certainly not the power it holds. I can hear you! In power? What are you talking about? This thing? Spider-Man says, holding out the stone. But before he could look at it further, the Hulk smacks him away. Spider-Man quickly grabs the stone before it can bounce too far away, but as it comes back, it slams into his forehead and sinks into the suit. Hulk begins stampeding towards Spider-Man, but this time, as he punches, a fist punches it back. Spider-Man begins to stand up with a more alien-like look and sharp teeth yelling for him to SHUT UP! He claws at the Hulk, knocking him down, telling him, I could barely hear myself think! And seeing what he just did, Spider-Man laughs. This is amazing! I've never felt so strong before! Like nothing can beat me again! Hulk gets back up, swinging his massive arms, narrowly missing Spider-Man, but as one lands squarely in Spider-Man's face, he stops. And Spider-Man stares. Oh, my turn. He sends the Hulk flying across the realm. But back at the museum, Black Cat says she doesn't understand. Why are they here again? Can't he just fawoof and wave his arms around and see where Spider-Man went? But Doctor Strange tells her, you do know how many dimensions there are, right? And as for what we're trying to do, we've come here so that I can recreate what happened by surrounding the ley lines. As the events begin to recreate themselves with the wave of Doctor Strange's hand, he sees the portal that took Spider-Man, but Carnilla begins to shout, STAY OUT OF THIS! Do not interfere in the affairs of Carnilla, the Norn Queen, or I swear on all that is holy, it will not end well for you, wizard. As Carnilla disappears, the two stare and Black Cat asks, just who is that? And Doctor Strange tells her, Carnilla rules an Asgardian province called Nornheim, and trust me, you wouldn't like it there. Carnilla is a powerful sorceress, and if she is interested in this, saving Spider-Man just got much harder. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the jungle, a group of primitive cavemen surround a creature that they were hunting, when suddenly a portal opens. Spider-Man and Hulk come barreling out, slamming into the ground, but as Spider-Man begins to get back up, a spear is thrown through his arm. He kicks the caveman away, yelling, Ah! Impacts aren't a problem, but the pointy stuff, that still hurts. However, Hulk punches, launching him into the ground, where Spider-Man begins to feel himself getting a bit slower. He tries to shake off the mud from his face, but without much luck, he pulls back the mask, giving himself some air. The Norn Stone dislodges itself, flying off, and Spider-Man asks, What are you doing again? Where the heck are we now? I was fighting the Hulk and... Oh, I'm sinking! Over with the Hulk, he's fighting off the cavemen that are now surrounding him. But then the stone flies around, slamming into the Hulk's forehead. The Hulk groans a bit as he rubs his forehead, but then he slowly reverts back to Bruce Banner. Looking around at all the cavemen, Bruce says, uh, hello, I think I'll be on my way now. But before he could leave, one of the cavemen knocks him out. Back of Spider-Man, he's trying to free himself from the sinking muck. But just as his head is about to go underwater, a giant red tail slaps the muck, letting him grab hold. He's flung out of the pit, asking who is he? And a caveman stands up. This is Devil Dinosaur, and you can call me Moon Boy. Once the three travel for a bit, Spider-Man asks, So this T-Rex, you guys are friends? And Moon Boy tells him, There are no words to describe our relationship. Well, the guy that, well, not exactly the guy, the green monster I was with. Any idea where he went? I saw no monster, just a normal man, very thin. The killer folk took him. Spider-Man says that there's not a lot of subtlety in that name, is there? And Moonboy tells him, no. Though the killer folk likely won't kill him themselves, they will probably sacrifice him to long legs. 
Off in a cave deeper in the forest, one of the killer folk lays Bruce down on a stone slab, calling out to long legs, stating, We present you with a feast! We hope that this will satisfy you and your children. Through the shadows, a long creature begins to slink through, and a giant spider stands over Bruce, beginning to spin its webs around him. But a voice in his head tells him that this is going to devour him and they need to free him. The stone is calling for him. It seeks true power. Let him out. It's long past. Just as Bruce is fully wrapped, the webbing begins to rip and the killer folk ask, what is that? A giant alien-like creature tears through the rest of the webbing and looks at them. Hello, my name is Brian, and I'm going to destroy you all. As Brian begins to rip long legs apart, he sees hundreds of little spiders coming out. Well, 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 he was a proud father. Brian begins to stomp on them, telling them all, By all means, Dad, bring them on. I love kids, just as my son. But outside, Spider-Man and Moon Boy arrive at Long Legs Cave when they hear something shuffling inside. Before they can get inside, Brian is riding Long Legs out of the cave, tearing him apart while everyone is watching. Meanwhile, over in Norn, Carnilla is searching the dimensions, trying to find the stone when she sees an image of it attached to Brian. She looks at her crystal ball, stating that she can see the stone empowering the one that they call the Hulk. It tends to do that. Skold, Erd, Verdandi, conjure some minions and retrieve that stone for me. Back in the jungle, Brian continues fighting long legs, and then he notices Spider-Man, telling him that he remembers him. He tries to convince Spider-Man that he knows who he is and that they fought, but Spider-Man is confused. That's not the Hulk, and that's not Banner. But then he notices the stone. Brian simply smells the air, telling him that it's so clean, and he's going to mess it up with some blood. So Spider-Man has one chance to leave. Still thinking that he's talking to Bruce, though, he tells him that he doesn't know what's gotten into him, but do not let the Hulk take over. Brian tells him that he's very wrong, and at that moment, Devil Dinosaur runs in. But as the Devil Dinosaur's head is slammed down, Brian manages to hold back the dinosaur himself when suddenly his face is webbed. But as they're beginning to argue about who should fight and what should be happening with this Brian Hulk banner monster, the sky opens up and tendrils reach down from a portal grabbing Spider-Man and Brian. They're pulled up into the air and they find themselves thrown onto a metal floor where a bunch of aliens surround them, pointing their guns, yelling, DESTROY THEM! Spider-Man sighs, realizing that he's now in another situation. Crow the Deviant steps forward, pushing the aliens aside. Seeing the stone in Brian's head, he demands that it be brought to immediately. As the Deviants are beginning to attack, Brian begins to throw them off, yelling, GET THESE THINGS OFF OF ME! THEY'RE REALLY STARTING TO ANNOY ME! And as the battle continues, Crow asks if they even know where they are because it doesn't appear that they do. Everyone hold your attacks, these creatures may prove useful. Let me show them to Lumeria, the home of the Deviants. Spider-Man asks, isn't Lumeria an undersea continent in the Indian Ocean? And Crow begins to walk them through the facility with Brian asking, what kind of a place is this? Crow tells them that they are in the weapons room now, that the Deviants are quite innovative, useful against their enemies. When Brian inquires who their enemies are, Crow grimaces, stating it's the Eternals. Now follow him, their survey room is just up ahead. In the next room, Spider-Man and Brian see all of the monitors, and Crow says that this is where they can spy on anyone on the world that they wish to. And they begin to have a battle with an Eternals vessel, as Spider-Man is yelling, whoa, 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 whoa! You're just gonna blow them out of the water? Without even knowing why they're coming here? And Crow tells them that it is simple. They are here for the Matrix, pointing at the crystal in Brian's head. When Crow realizes that Brian and Spider-Man don't know what they're holding this whole time, he explains that when the universe was in its infancy, they were aware of the existence of others and were curious to visit. So they created a series of gems, which are now referred to as the Norn Stones. These stones enabled the Celestials to traverse the dimension, but there was one stone made to control the power of the others, and it was referred to as the Matrix Stone. The Matrix Stone has been lost for eons, that is, until now. Brian asks, so it increases the strength of whoever bonds with it, right? Then I could. He begins to grow in size, smacking Crow away, telling him that he's going to dispose of him. Still thinking that it's Bruce, Spider-Man yells to him that he's got to take charge, and Brian yells back to stop calling him that. He clamps his hands together, creating a shock wave like the Hulk does, ripping everything apart and throwing Spider-Man to the side. Then he laughs as he walks over to the dazed Spider-Man. As he's about to kill him, though, he's blasted away. The Eternal Icarus looks down, telling him, It seems that you are intent on killing him, my strangely clad friend. Are you all right? As the rest of the Eternals board the base, they are shot by a giant energy rifle, and Brian laughs at him. Oh, this is a fun toy! Such a shame that you knocked me into the weapons room. 
However, the portal begins to open and the Norn warriors jump out with Spider-Man yelling, not these guys again. But this time, Carnilla steps out stating that if something is to be done correctly, it is necessary to attend to it herself. She walks over to Brian and just simply tears the gem out of his head. He begins to revert back to his old green self, to his normal Hulk self, with Icarus yelling to drop the stone, but Carnilla laughs and a portal opens up as she tells him that he is truly pretty, but tragically, she has other plans. Farewell! Before the portal could close, Spider-Man and Icarus jump through, and after that, the Hulk. And as the three land, Spider-Man asks, now where are we? But in this spot, a larger-than-life Carnilla looks down at them, telling them that they are in Nornheim, children. The realm of Carnilla who now has sufficient power to challenge Odin himself for dominance of the Nine Realms. Spider-Man gets up stating, I hate to admit this, but this is way above my pay grade. The Hulk shouts, jumping up, and before he can make it, Carnilla effortlessly smacks him across the land. Icarus yells to release her hold on the Matrix Stone or suffer the consequences, but as Icarus concentrates his heat blast on Carnilla, she laughs, telling him, ah, the power of a hundred suns, harnessed by his eyes, it tickles. Suddenly, Carnilla's feet are webbed together and Spider-Man slams her into the ground, jumping on top and beginning to repeatedly punch her. He continues stating that she must be stunned. He's doing it! Oh, no, wait, I'm screwed. She grabs him by the neck, telling him it's time to die. But at that moment, she's struck from behind. And over in Doctor Strange's Sanctum Sanctorum, Black Cat is yelling, We did it! Now bring him back! But back over in Normine, each of the heroes begin to take turns trying to bring Carnilla down with no success since Doctor Strange can't yank them all back through the portal. As Spider-Man begins to get back up, he sees Black Cat standing over him asking what is going on, and she tells him that Doctor Strange sent her to help. But his spider sense begins to tingle all over again. He turns around to find three robed women that can tell that he can sense danger, and they inform him that they are the Norns. They fight the Queen, or at least they try to. But you're not doing especially well, are you, Peter? Black Cat is confused, wondering how they even know his name, and they respond telling her that they are the Norns. All of the past, present, and future are open to them. If it is to be known, they will know it. Spider-Man yells, and they must know that whatever that Horn Lady has planned, it's not going to end well. That stone represents ultimate power, and ultimate power never ends well. Back outside with Hulk and Icarus, they continue to fight against Carnilla. As she continues smacking them down, shouting the power of the celestial beings is now coursing through her. None can stand up to her! She shall rule over. Just then she's grabbed from behind and the eternal Zurus grabs her telling her, Greetings child, we have not been introduced yet. Though restrained, she laughs, Indeed! And I can tell that you're exhausting your power to match my size. Zurus tells her true, but he brought a friend. And that's when she sees Odin. It's nice that you remember who I am, but you seem to have forgotten yourself. You are not some supreme power or celestial force. You are but the Norn Queen, and you have overstepped your bounds. He reaches up, pulling the stone out of her head, telling her, This power is too fearsome to be allowed to exist. And Zurus asks if he can dispose of it with Odin crushing it. Easily. She shrinks back down in size, asking how did Odin know about this? And Black Cat tells her it was them. Well, them and the Norns. But as Hulk begins to complain because Carnilla has begun to cry, they are all pulled into a portal, and they all find themselves back in the Sanctum Sanctorum. Doctor Strange tells them that it took him a while to wind up a dimension sufficiently close to their own, but it is done. Everything is back to where it should be. Spider-Man asks what of the Hulk, and Doctor Strange tells him that the Hulk is back at the crossroads. Ideally, like originally planned, he will live out the rest of his days there. Black Cat throws her arms around Spider-Man, telling him that she saw bits and pieces of what he was going through. We'll have to tell her everything that happened. And Spider-Man tells her, Trust me, you really don't want to know everything I just did. And there you guys have it. I hope you enjoyed these Symbiote Spider-Man storylines. I'm pretty sure we covered all the ones that have come out, but if I missed one, let me know in the comments down below because we can bring it to the channel within the next couple of weeks. I thought it was a fun concept to bring back that classic era and tell more stories, but by the time we got to Crossroads with the Hulk, it just kind of went a little crazy where we were like, why? Now you're just making up reasons why he doesn't remember. But what do you guys think? Let us know in the comments down below as your comments are what keep this channel going. So any comment you can leave from, I hated it, I loved it, hey, I like cake, any of those will do great. And give this video a like. Those are the things we need to keep this channel alive. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you next time right here.